Hello, welcome to Legal Cut Pro, the Canadian Entertainment Law Podcast. My name is Greg Pang. And I'm Michelle Molyneux. And today is our first substantive episode mm-hmm. of this podcast. So we are going to talk about who owns your picture in the context of a lawsuit in the United States of a supermodel, I believe, Gigi or Gigi Hadid? Hadid, yes. Hadid, yeah. She has been sued for copyright infringement of a photo of herself. So we will be talking about that in the context of copyright and how it can provide some lessons for producers of film and uh, television content in terms of copyright. I know it's very basic, but this is our very first substantive episode, so let's keep it basic today. Sounds great. Excellent. So how are you this week, Michelle? I'm good. I'm freezing cold. How about yourself, Greg? I am generally keeping warm, but I'm uh, also, it's it's been some very cold riding. Oh, today was what, a high minus, I don't know, 20? Yeah. 20, yeah, something like that. That's, yeah, so, that sounds yeah. generous. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm still keeping warm and uh, keeping safe. Today, I just, uh, just a couple hours before this, I was teaching my class at uh, McEwen University and someone pulled a fire alarm. So oh. that was uh, that was interesting. <laughs> I saw at least one person come out of the gym uh, with a, a foil blanket on. So oh, that no. person looked very, very cold. <laughs> Luckily, you know, we had time. It was a very weird alarm. It was going off and it was saying someone has something something to the effect of someone has pulled a fire alarm, stand by for instructions. And it was this loop of this automated voice playing over the PA. So we couldn't lecture. So we just let all our students go. And Aww. and we just uh, came back to the office and did some work and prepared for this podcast. And here we are. So we were probably better off for that because I had a little bit more time to prepare today. <laughs> Perfect. So let's Get on to our legal disclaimer. Yes, legal disclaimer. This podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. We are not providing you with legal advice, and nothing we say on this podcast should be construed as legal advice. If you require legal advice or counsel, please seek the services of a lawyer. Perfect. Thank you, Michelle. So the topic today, of course, is, as mentioned, the Gigi Hadid lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And we're going to just give you a little bit of a rundown about what the lawsuit is about, found out by way of a BuzzFeed article, and we have looked at the actual claim that was filed. And we'll provide some comments as it applies to Canadian copyright law and some analysis of it. Not too deep, of course. There's not a whole lot that happened other than the filing of the claim. And I think that that'll be it for today. Yeah, that sounds great. Excellent. So, Michelle, you want to tell us a little bit about just uh, Cole's notes of this lawsuit? Yes, definitely. Uh, So, supermodel Gigi Hadid has been sued by a New York City-based photo agency. The photo agency is alleging that Hadid posted one of its photos on her Instagram account without permission. And the super crazy part about this is the photo is actually of Hadid herself. In the photo, she's wearing kind of a a denim outfit and she is smiling, looking straight into the camera. It seems that actually a lot of uh, celebrities are being sued by photographers and this trend sometimes has been referred to as copyright trolling. There have been a lot of celebrities that have been affected and so we thought it would be interesting to kind of explore what's going on with the case and and see how this might be relevant to filmmakers. Perfect. Thank you, Michelle. And what's interesting, and we'll put it in the show notes as well, we'll post a BuzzFeed link and in the BuzzFeed link, there's a copy or scan of the filed claim that's embedded there. So there's a way to download and, and print that off if you want to read the full claim. But I'll uh, go through uh, some, of the, some of the claim here. Actually, let's before we go, uh, go to there, uh, Michelle, let's let's talk a little bit about monetizing on Instagram. So here, this is a lawsuit about someone posting a photo of themselves taken by someone else, a rights holder, and they posted it on Instagram. So let's let's go through a little bit about what uh, monetization on Instagram might look like. So my understanding is, say, a celebrity such as Hadid, who has a very large following, is that there would be companies who would pay her to make posts advertising their products or of her using their products or that type of thing. And she would be paid very generously based on her very large number of followers. So I've heard rumor that uh, Gigi purportedly makes almost 300,000 per sponsored Instagram And that's US dollars, right? I would imagine, yeah. So that's like (laughs) a 
billion Canadian or something yeah. on their exchange rate. And, anyways. Yeah, but so my understanding is, yeah, for these sponsored posts, she can make a lot of money. Um, and then the flip side would be is perhaps posts like the one that is subject of the lawsuit uh, would just maybe help herself build her brand and help enable her to sell those sponsored posts. But from the information that we have, it does not not appear that she's making some kind of paper like her view or something like that off of this post in particular, right? I don't believe so, no. 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 So I think this would just be helping, sort of showing this is me in my day-to-day life, and that would help kind of build her brand as an influencer, I guess. Okay. And, and for, you know, for context, she has this, Gigi Hadid has, I think as of the date of this recording, 45, over 45 million followers on Instagram. And that, that was about the same number at the time of the filing of the lawsuit and time of the, the claimed infringement. So we're not talking small numbers here. These, no. these are big, big numbers, right? I mean, basically the number of followers that we have on Instagram. <laughs> right, right. Exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so let's uh, go into a few particulars of this lawsuit here. So here it's, it's a, a lawsuit, an American lawsuit filed in New York by the plaintiff is exclusive hyphen Lee Inc. And it claims that here in the pleading is that Hadid copied and uploaded the copyright photograph uh, to her Instagram account, as we mentioned. And the entire lawsuit is over this one photo. And in Exhibit 1, we see that it appears to be, and it's not quite clear in the pleading, is that it looks like a paparazzi photo. Mm-hmm. I mean, she looks very happy to have it taken. Yeah. <laughs> and it implies that the photo was taken in a public place but it looks like a paparazzi photo yes yeah definitely yeah Yeah. so so that's what it looks like so that's this is the interesting thing about this it's a paparazzi photo taken and the rights holder is is this company called exclusive actually just a slight correction to what we mentioned before it says that hadid's instagram account is followed by more than 53 million so that's 53 million at probably at the time of filing and this was filed just not too long ago actually i think just a couple months ago um, so yeah, she gained like two million more followers since then. Wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, maybe partly because of this lawsuit, because if you search her name on Google, you'll find a number of stories on this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, more than 1.6 million followers commented on Instagram posts within four days. So not sure if how many of those 1.6 million comments were attributed to this post in mm. particular. Because the way I know Instagram works is that you, you comment on particular posts, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't allege, not sure how relevant it is, but it could, could have been relevant here, uh, how many likes it received as well, because mm-hmm. it could probably receive a whole lot too, I'm guessing, right? So, and it goes on to further state here that Hadid had firsthand knowledge that copying and posting photographs of herself or other subject matters to her Instagram or other social media accounts that she did not properly license or otherwise receive permission from the copyright holder constituted copyright infringement. Dun, so this, dun, dun. <laughs> yes. So this is the meat of the claim here. This is interesting enough. It also went to state and that it says that Hadid was named as a defendant and served a copy of a complaint and it talks about a previous lawsuit and the style of cause is Peter Sapita and Yelena Nura Gigi Hadid. Okay, that's her name and IMG Worldwide. So that's probably the rights holder there. And in this pleading it alleges that the facts in that case are very similar to the facts in the claim that they've launched against Hadid, including, and just in small brackets here, that Hadid was, uh, this this photo was taken in the public street in New York. Hmm. So interestingly enough, as we mentioned, it looks like a paparazzi photo and the pleading itself doesn't actually list many or state much in terms of particulars of the circumstances or the situation. But I could see that some of the strategy behind it is like they want us to take a straight line towards there's a work here, we own it, someone else infringed on it, we're suing them, and we're claiming X, Y, Z. And it actually goes on to state, it's kind of interesting, this claim is only in respect of one photo, but it goes on to list 50 examples in Exhibit 5, it states here, of other uncredited photographs that Hadid has posted to her social media accounts. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's kind of interesting. It's hmm. Perhaps they're trying to show reckless disregard or, or something, uh, or words of that uh, uh, nature, that she is willfully infringing on all these poor copyright owners and you know mm-hmm. to, to boost her own celebrity with these great paparazzi photos. <laughs> and uh, just uh, not to go on too much more, but 
it uh, states here that exclusive is the copyright owner or licensee of the exclusive rights of that photograph and that they filed for a copyright registration with the United States Copyright Office. So that's relevant in the U.S. because you can access statutory damages. But I'm uncertain. I don't know a whole lot about U.S. copyright law, but they plead statutory damages here. I believe you can only get statutory damages after registration. So mm. I'm not sure how that would work in terms of timing, in terms of their pleading here and it goes on finally to state Hadid violated exclusive exclusive rights <laughs> of reproduction and distribution Hadid's actions constitute infringement of exclusive copyright they're seeking a declaration of that yes this is infringing copyright they're looking for an injunction they're looking for an accounting for profits which is quite interesting we'll talk about that in a second and they're looking for statutory damages as, as I stated I'm not sure how that would work in terms of timing if they just did a filing mm. and they're claiming costs of course so I just want to get your impression, Michelle. What's your overall impression of this lawsuit? It's very interesting. I mean, on the one hand, you see it's her own image. So you would mm -hmm. intuitively think, you know, she should be allowed to post it. But on the flip side, I mean, she's using somebody else's work to help build her brand on Instagram. That's right. And I'm, I'm pretty sure she could afford to hire her own photographers to take these photographs of her. Yeah rather than just taking advantage of somebody else's work without crediting or properly paying them for it. That's true. That, that, that's true. It's not a defense in copyright, but a perhaps a, a counter to an argument like that, which, which has a lot of merit, is that, well, this is a picture of her. It's her likeness that's being profited off of. And for that rights holder to turn around and sue her you know, to ask her to account for profits and, you know, and get statutory damages. Something just smells about that, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but in full context, you know, this is a lot of things are contextual, but like you mentioned, she can use these photos and amongst the 50 or more other un allegedly uncredited, mm -hmm. perhaps infringing works to further boost her own celebrity, which is pretty significant you know, at, yeah. the, at this point. I, I don't know about her, but from reading this, she, she looks pretty popular. I think she's one of know? the top 10 or so oh, really? on Instagram Yeah, in terms of followers. Okay, that's really, really significant. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I did not know that. Okay, that that's, yeah. okay, so 45 million. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. up there. <laughs> okay, okay that, that's really interesting. So mm -hmm. the context would be quite quite different if it was just a private citizen and perhaps caught in some kind of either embarrassing or compromising situation mm -hmm. having their photo taken in public and then perhaps they thought it was funny and posted it on their own social media and they turn around and get sued by by a rights holder that that's a different kind of situation but that photo of you taken in public mm -hmm. where Generally, without doing a deep dive in privacy law, you have a lower reasonable expectation of privacy. Mm -hmm. You know, as opposed to a paparazzi photo of a celebrity on their own property and taken with a you know five hundred millimeter telephoto lens or mm -hmm. something like that, right? So the privacy argument might not hold up here, but I, I don't want to get into that too much. Yeah, it's it's really interesting with this one is that okay? So let's go back to the monetization here. Is that she might not be making money directly on this photograph, right? Right. At least from what we know. Mm -hmm. But it boosts her celebrity so that she can get those other sponsored photos. Mm -hmm. And and can you explain what 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 this what's a sponsored photo? Um, I, I think it could be either either a sponsored photo or video, and it could be anything from uh, the celebrity directly endorsing a product or brand, or. Um, maybe they're wearing a particular clothing line or eating a particular food or something like that. And people then feel, oh, well, if this celebrity is doing it, I should too. Oh. So, so it can be indirect or direct. And I believe there are new rules um, somewhat evolving as well as whether influencers have to indicate whether their post is in fact a sponsored ad or not. Okay, that's interesting. That mm -hmm. is really, really interesting. And from what you found, she could be making about 300000 U.S. on such sponsored posts, right? Yes, yeah. See, that's pretty big money. What One thing that uh, we don't have further information on is their claim of accounting for profits. Now, a straight line claim to accounting for profits is how much money did you make due to your infringing activity mm -hmm. uh, on, on what you did here. And... It, from what we know, that that could be zero, right? Yes, yeah. But indirectly, 
because she can receive further sponsorship and boost her celebrity and get make more money, then this could have that contributory factor to her making more money. Yeah, definitely. And if you think over the context too, if she's had 50 or more of these type images, yes. she's essentially almost potentially maybe building a large portion of her Instagram using these copyright infringed photos. Yeah, very interesting. So it'll be interesting to see if this settles or if it actually goes to trial and see how they're, they're going to prove their claim and how they're going to try to account for such profits. If they're going to make some kind of speculative claim or calculation and state that, okay, so because of this, we're contributed such and such percent to you getting all these sponsored posts and therefore you owe us $100,000 or, some, or something like that, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know how they're going to do that. And it's not particularized on how, you know, in terms of uh, even, they don't even give a number for an, an accounting here. So that, that'll be really interesting. So yeah, so let's, uh, let's go on a little bit now to, to kind of tie this, since this is a Canadian entertainment law podcast, let's tie mm -hmm. this to Canadian copyright law. So Michelle, you want to just explain a little bit about the first owner of copyright? Yeah, definitely. So looking at the Copyright Act, uh, Canadian statute, uh, section 13 discusses that the author of a work shall be the first owner of the copyright therein. So in a case such as the Hadid lawsuit, that would be the author of the work would be the photographer or the agency that the photographer obviously sold the rights of the photo to. Yep, exactly. Yes. So here we can assume and it states it pleads that they are either the owner or licensee. So there's some agreement that we don't see behind there that they would likely have to prove and file as, as their, their evidence or at least in, in, disclose to the other party that, okay, yeah, so this was the photographer. Here is the agreement with the photographer and yes, all rights to this photograph were transferred to us. So that's where we're the, we're the owner here. Or at least that's how it would work in, you know, in the Canadian context. And this kind of copyright ownership concept is, to my knowledge, similar in, in the United States, even though the, the copyright legislation in the United States is uh, different in many respects, but I believe this is similar there. So just uh, going on that, now, now we nail down who is the first copyright owner and that, that kind of right can be licensed or transferred, then what are the rights of a copyright owner? Mm -hmm. So a, the rights of a copyright owner are generally, generally the, they have the sole right to produce or reproduce the work in which they own the copyright. And under our legislation, it particularizes a number of different medium and some of these rights that uh, come along with being a copyright owner. And this is very similar to how it works in the United States too, as the copyright owner. And it states it, it is pleaded in there is that we being exclusive, have the sole right to uh, produce, reproduce, distribute, etc. this photograph. And th there's, there's no room in there to say that, well, you know, but if it's a picture of you, then, then you have some kind of implied license or something like that, right? So no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> I guess we can just move on now to, uh, I know Michelle, before we're talking off pod about a situation, not, not so much a situation, but, uh, but uh, well, yeah, it's a sort of... <laughs> I got in trouble. <laughs> not, not, not that much trouble, but yeah, 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 yeah it's just, it's just to explain about what, uh, about your demo reel. Yeah, so several years back, I finally got around to kind of editing my demo reel, putting it together. And I just assumed the best way to advertise myself would be to post my demo reel on to YouTube. And it went fairly unnoticed for several years. <laughs> and then I received um, uh, an email from YouTube informing me that I had copyright material on my YouTube post. And my options at that point were to either take the video down completely or to add uh, advertising at the front and then the distributor of the film that I had worked on would receive the, I guess, funding from the commercial advertising. So it was a very interesting lesson on uh, learning of what happens when you put up copyrighted material, and also learning that as the actor, even though it was images of myself, and I mean, obviously I was also somewhat promoting the works I had been in as well, that I still wasn't the ultimate copyright owner. Yeah, you did that you didn't have the right to uh, produce and reproduce mm -hmm. the the work right yes even as yep. a demo reel for yourself mm -hmm. unless there was some kind of clause in your contract that states that you may use clips of 
but but you know that's you know, we don't need to get into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I just know that for some contracts that I prepared and some contracts I've reviewed for you know, for photographers and and other types of works that the 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 author or the creators of the work uh, will want to negotiate that carve out to be able to use that work or display the work uh, for the purposes of their portfolio, mm-hmm. which is what you did, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So. That's interesting because so you didn't get actual direct communication from the distributor themselves. It was it was, no, it was YouTube, YouTube slash Google or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think um, I'm guessing the distributor, obviously someone there, found the clip, and through that went through YouTube, kind of as the mediary between us two. Okay, that's interesting because I wonder if they did that because they know that this is a demo reel. This is you instead of using the blunt instrument of a DMCA notice and takedown approach to essentially just hard hard stop take it down mm-hmm. but they said well this is her appearing in it you know this this is michelle appearing in this and this is our work but this is also something that perhaps we can make some money off of and there's there's not a whole lot of harm here in the actor promoting our work mm-hmm. right so Yeah, so I think in the end it became kind of mutually beneficial that I could keep it up and if there were a lot of views that then they were making money off of it. So, right. yeah, it kind of, it turned out well in the end. I was a bit scared when I first got the email and started reading it. Right. And how long ago around was this? (laughs) Oh gosh, it was definitely several years back, possibly even over five. So prior to your call to the bar then yes okay. <laughs> prior to law school yeah okay all right <laughs> and I was gonna say a disclaimer to anyone casting me going forward I have learned my lesson and I will not post without permission <laughs> excellent very good <laughs> so what's interesting there is that you were able to come to this compromise with the distributor by way of the intermediary YouTube there but in the case that we just talked about mm-hmm. there was no such compromise it seems like i mean we don't have all the facts right so the yeah. the pleading does not disclose any it doesn't make reference to any negotiations or anything like that any reasonable offers that were given to the model so and you mentioned as well that there's this uh it's called copyright trolling I think. Yes, yeah i think that's the term people are calling it so and this is where and i just uh, just looking at the buzzfeed article here some of the I don't want to call them victims, and that, that's wrong. But some of the celebrities who have been sued for very similar activity have included like Kim Kardashian, Jennifer Lopez, Fifty Cent, or Fifty Cent, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> and Jessica Simpson, uh, who, who have been sued doing exactly this. Right. So I wonder if it's just if it's one of those calculated ways, and maybe this is what copyright, the term copyright trolling, comes from, is that the rights holders jump on this and saying that okay we'll sue you maybe knowing the merits are not we have we have merit of course we're the copyright holder but maybe we don't intend to take this all away we'll just take a ten thousand dollar settlement especially from these very big celebrities like this Gigi Hadid or Kim Kardashians and Jennifer Lopez is out there who are very deep pocketed mm-hmm. and rather than being dragged through a trial we'll, we'll just give you 10 grand and you go away and that's an easy way for these rights holders to to make their money Yes. Yeah, you know, speculating that, and it seems like that's what the concept of copyright trolling is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've run into sort of a similar situation in practice, but but not with respect to celebrities, where you know rights holders, very large rights holders, would demand settlement for infringement and just say eight thousand bucks, you know, for you using this image that we have the rights to on your blog, because you know it's it's for a business, it's a business blog, so it's commercial infringement. Give us eight thousand bucks, and we'll settle this, quote unquote. So yeah, so it's it very interesting, and uh, we'll, we'll see where this where, where this leads to. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I guess the the lesson in film is that it's it's all about who owns the rights, mm-hmm. right? It's it's not about who is in it; it's about who owns the rights, and that before whether you are, you know, whether you're a producer, you're an artist, or something like that, you have to make sure that before you use or reproduce, make copies of whatever of. A, a piece of work that even if it includes it is your image or mm-hmm. likeness in it that you have to make sure that you have those rights and sometimes you might not have those rights uh, surprising you you might make assumptions that mm-hmm. you have those rights but you don't have those rights yeah definitely just I, yeah I guess just a general awareness of who actually has the rights before you do anything <laughs> exactly exactly and uh, this can manifest itself not in just in terms of photos on Instagram but you know music 
-hmm. like uh, perhaps you're working with an an artist, a, a musician. I said, hey, can we, can we use this a song that uh, you uh, that you and your band were a part of? He's like, yeah, go ahead. Well, they might not actually have the authority <laughs> to grant mm -hmm. you that license. You know, there's publishers involved. There's uh, licensing of the master and things like that. So, it's you have to be very cognizant when you are using copyrighted works that you are licensing them properly. Yeah, I think that's all I all I have to say about that. Anything else on the the case there, Michelle? Ah, uh, I don't have anything except that uh, the listeners should follow us on Instagram. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll mention that at the end. But yeah, we we have we have an Instagram account, and so far we, as of this recording, we have one post. It's a placeholder right now, and we're waiting for our podcast cover art to be posted on there. Um, no copyright infringement. No. <laughs> and and listeners, sharp listeners out there might be wondering, Legal Cut Pro, hmm, that sounds familiar. We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> <laughs> it is referential, but we deny any trademark infringement. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, so let's get on to the uh, part of our podcast. We'll just talk about a few happenings in the industry, um, perhaps some other decisions or other stories out there, events that are relevant to the entertainment industry that, that we want, or, or something that we want to plug. I'll, I'll actually go first. By the time this gets this episode gets released, whenever it gets released, this might be already over, but I'd like to mention it anyway. There is an organization in Edmonton here called Girls in Film and TV. Their website is girlsinfilmtv.com, and they're having a launch slash fundraiser on February 19th at 7 p.m. at Lexus South Point. And I encourage you to actually go visit that website. They are doing some uh, very awesome things for girls aged 13 to 17. I think that's their target to get them into film and show them the ropes and get them experience to uh, and making film, uh, making you know television and film. So this is this is a really cool not-for-profit venture and the, pe the, the people behind it, the two principals behind it are Eric Rybalkin and uh, Camille Baudouin uh, of Mosaic Entertainment, uh, friends of mine. And uh, yeah, so I encourage you to visit that website and if this episode gets released before then, I encourage you to come join us all at Lexus South Point on February 19th. I will post the the, the website and the, the link to, if it's not over already, the link to the Eventbrite page for that uh, on the, in the show notes. So yeah. uh, what do you got, Michelle? Um, I have on March 2nd, a Rapid Fire Theater is hosting their annual date night event. And that event involves wonderful comedy and improv and auctioning bid items. So some of them include having coffee with the mayor. So that's kind of cool. And that's all in support of Improvaganza that comes in June. Cool. Do you do improv, Michelle? I do improv classes. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool, cool. That would be, I think that would be kind of quite frightening, actually, uh, just uh, doing improv. It, it's actually pretty terrifying every class yeah. I do or if I do a workshop show, but then afterwards, the high is so addicting. Is it really? That hey? you go back into the fear again. <laughs> really? Okay, that's that's interesting. Uh, something you might not, not know about me, but when you say that, I have images of being punched, and, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Because I believe it or not, like if, if people who don't know me, I, I'm I'm a pretty small guy. I I long time ago I used to do some amateur boxing. I actually never got to a point of getting a fight, but I remember sparring. It'd be one of those things I'd be like, it'd just be so nervous sparring because everyone would always be bigger, longer reach than me. But but in the end, it kind of always felt good. Mm -hmm. It never feels good right beforehand or during getting hit. But, but in the end, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, it feels so manly, I guess. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't do that anymore. I, don't, I just don't like getting hit in the head, and, and I'm a bit too old for that now. So I was going to say, I feel like that also parallels the filmmaking process Does it, eh? Okay. Like, like, uh, like, like boxing? <laughs> I think Taking so, yeah. yeah. It's, it's scary, and throughout it, everyone doesn't know what's happening, and there's all that fear. And But then when the finished product is done, you're like, I'm really glad we did that. Excellent. <laughs> and all those nights of 6 a.m.s and the freezing cold cold or sweltering heat but it's worth it in the end <laughs> yes yes exactly so anything else for me michelle on your end oh that's all for me for events and happenings okay i just well, i'm going to mention you know one thing that we're going to be following it's kind of interesting out there and i i do have some canadian case law that'd be interesting to talk about uh, some copyright uh case uh, law um you know relevant to the entertainment industry but i don't want to talk about that yet i'm still digesting that just went through the uh, Lost Society of Ontario's annual IP review. 
Uh, but maybe we'll talk about that another time. But uh, just another just point of interest, uh, there are some big, big changes coming to the Canadian Trademarks Act. And the Canadian Intellectual Property Office is holding, I guess, uh, seminars uh, mainly for uh, trademark lawyers and agents all across the country to be familiarized with all these changes to the Trademarks Act because there's a lot of things going to be affecting trademarks practice. And trademarks, uh, I only bring it up because it is an aspect of intellectual property law. And it, it it does affect entertainment law. It affects its branding, logos, et cetera, et cetera. So the one I'm going to next month, March 13, is going to be in Calgary at uh, Norton Rose's office. So I hope to be better educated on the cha- changes in the Trademarks Act and its regulations after then. Th- I think that's it for our news and and plugs uh, for ourselves. So uh, Michelle, can you t- tell our listeners uh, where they can find you? Yeah, you can find me at either through email, michelle at legalcutpro.com, or you can also find me on Instagram at Michelle Molyneux. Perfect. And you can find me, Greg, at legalcutpro.com, or on Twitter at Cyclos, C-Y-C-L-A-W, your original cycling lawyer. And you can find us, these, this podcast that is, uh, on Instagram as well, at legalcutpro. The website is legal cutpro.com and um, whenever this gets posted in whatever podcast catcher you are subscribing to or that you use please subscribe leave a comment send us some feedback show suggestions episode suggestions whatever you feel like so we would love to entertain those and other than that uh, thank you listeners for listening to us and thank you Michelle for joining me on this uh, dark cold late afternoon (laughs) thank you Greg and thank you to all the listeners bye see you next time (laughs) 